you probably noticed, but AI is getting really good really quickly. It feels like at the moment that there's a release from one of the big AI companies almost every week. And honestly, you get the stuff in your hands and it's incredible. And it's not just me that's saying this. I mean, there are Silicon Valley insiders like Mark Benioff saying about Gemini 3, which is Google's latest AI model, the leap is insane. I mean, these are really serious improvements. And of course, you can dismiss all this as hype. And yeah, look, for sure, there is a lot of hype right now around AI. But at the same time, there are mathematical measures of how good AI is getting. They're called benchmarks. And basically, the way things work is that the AI companies put their models through a series of tests, kind of like a final set of exams before they release them. And according to these exams, the results they're getting are also getting better and better and better. We keep on seeing improvements. And remember, this is the worst right now. This is the worst that AI is ever going to be. It's only going to get better from here. And to be honest, I mean, I've been actually been struggling to put this into perspective for myself. So I wanted to speak to one of the, the most influential AI founders in London, a guy called Mark Warner. He runs a, a tech company called Faculty. And perhaps more importantly, he's a scientist who's been, been in AI right since the beginning. He left physics about, um, I think about 10 years ago and went into AI. So he's been there since the start. And I said to him, look, can you help me explain what these benchmarks show? And he said, sure. In fact, I can do it in one graph. Right, so Mark, so yeah, can you explain to me what we're seeing here? Um, well, so this is a really interesting experiment from an organization called Meta, where they took a, about 170 software development tasks and they got humans to do them, 40, of, 40 odd humans. And then they said, on average, how long does it take a human to do it? And then they took all the AI models from about 2019 to right up to the modern day and said, um, for each of those tasks, what sort of human equivalent time do they achieve a 50% success rate on? So there's a slightly complicated thing, but ultimately they're asking, um, how does the AI compare to the human's ability to do a particular task? And then they just plotted it out. So they just plotted um, all of these models against the task time that they achieved a 50% success rate on. What they found was this unbelievable pattern where there's a very strong exponential trend. Now, of course, in recent history, we know that humans have an, uh, a poor intuition for exponentials, and these things, you know, the actual lived experience of an exponential, as you can see on this graph, is roughly nothing, 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 everything. And that's you know, what I think we need to think hard about in this context. I'm just going to jump in here because there's a little bit of context you might be missing. When Mark says that people have a poor intuition for exponentials, he's really talking about his own personal experience. Because back in March 2020, faculty was working for the NHS, modelling the data on this strange new virus that seems to be spreading really fast. And what Mark realised was the coronavirus was on an exponential curve. It had this pattern, nothing, 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 everything. As it happened, Mark's brother Ben was working at Downing Street at the time. And Dominic Cummings, the chief of staff, ended up taking Mark and Ben to Downing Street to persuade him to change his strategy. Because if he didn't, the NHS was going to collapse. I know that Mark Warner is one of the smartest and most ethical people that I've ever met in my life. I think without him, thousands of people would be dead. Mark actually played quite an important role in history then. But really, for our purposes, this is really about understanding that Mark has been here before. He's seen an exponential curve at the beginning, and that's what he's warning is happening again. How reliable are these, are these figures? You're working with AI on the ground. Mm. Is this what you're seeing in your everyday life? So I think inside the context of software engineering and over this sort of time span, intuitively, everyone can feel the massive progress. Like down here, these models were absolutely unhelpful for programming. Up here, for particular elements of different programming tasks, they can speed you up 10, 20 times. So intuitively, some pattern like this is real. Now the exact details of any particular evaluation metric and any particular task may be a more questionable because it's really hard to measure. Um, we don't even really have enough of a theory of intelligence to be able to say this is exactly the thing you have to measure. So what we spend our time doing is creating lots and lots of little tests and then sort of trying to piece together something from that, from all these kind of individual measurements 
that is telling us more about the, the sort of wider whole. I think the things that are genuinely um, totally unknown is, does this line extend further? And how should you take this insight and generalize it across a bunch of other sorts of tasks that obviously we care about a lot? You know, if, if LLMs only restrict themselves to software engineering, it's a very big deal if your job is software engineering, but for the rest of society it doesn't matter that much. But if this kind of trend holds true for more, like a large proportion of intellectual tasks, that's very meaningful. Because my sense is that, say, in terms of being able to talk like a human or generate images that are incredibly realistic, everything that feels like it's following that same direction. Is that your sense too? Yeah, I mean, again, it's, it's really hard to construct great measurements, but when you look at individual benchmarks on almost anything, what you see is the hard problem is now finding tests that still, it doesn't just absolutely saturate the benchmark on immediately. And so lots and lots of work is going on to constructing really clever tests that these things can't just immediately pass. It's interesting to think, at what point on this graph was the Turing test? Because yeah. that was the big test, right? Yeah. And I feel like we blew past it about, yeah, about there or something. Somewhere here maybe, yeah. sort of intuitively, where it's like, this is unbelievable. I mean, I remember when um, ChatGPT came out, I could tell that this was gonna be you know, one of the most important technology releases of our uh, lives. But it still wasn't actually that useful for me to do for in my work. And then sort of somewhere a year or two later, I suddenly realized that this is like, or at least for a decent number of tasks, as good as, as good as my efforts. If you had to guess, what would you say would be the shape of this curve from there? Is it just gonna keep on going up? It, How? Can't, it can't keep on going up forever. So, um, so eventually, if you sort of naively extended this trend, the amount of energy you'd need to train these models would be you know, more than exists on the, whole, on the whole planet. So this has to top out at some point. We're doing a bunch of work to try and understand exactly when and where that, um, where that will happen. But uh, I think it's probably likely that there's at least another sort of five years of this. And it's worth saying that what this, this trend is showing is that these tasks, the tasks that AI is capable of, is doubling every seven months. So even if you extend this trend out for another, let's say, five years, that's a lot of doublings. A lot of doublings. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, because that, that line would be almost through the ceiling with that level of doublings. Totally. That feels quite scary, if I'm honest. Well, How I think, do you feel I about it? One thing to remember is that this is showing the 50% success rate. Right? That's actually not very useful for most real-world applications. You're not going to be able to automate a business process with a 50% success rate. You know, most real business processes have to run on 99 and 99.9% .9 success rate, which, if you do the maths, it shifts everything down and slows everything down. Um, but I think we absolutely need to be preparing for this properly. Like, if this turns out to be true, it's a huge, a huge, huge deal. Um, and, you know, just like we saw in COVID, if you don't prepare for exponentials properly, they can really hurt you when things start to get very serious. Um, and so, you know, I think we have to maintain this like dual track of, on the one hand, we don't know whether this will continue and we don't know how it will generalize to other tasks. On the other hand, if it does continue and if it does generalize, it will be easily the biggest technology trend of our lifetimes. And so given the, its importance, serious people should be thinking about how we deal with this. You say it's the biggest technology trend of our lifetimes. It will probably be the biggest economic shift, social shift, yes. cultural. Yeah, can you try and help me understand <laughs> um, yeah, how, how big this is? Like put it into some kind of perspective. Um, I don't know that I am the best person for that. In some sense, I think you should be putting it into perspective uh, um, for your viewers. Like, I can tell you about the technical detail, but maybe to try, um, you know, what this is pointing to, if the trend holds, is a fundamental reshaping of how intellectual tasks are done. So this, I should say, actually, 
this doesn't apply to physical tasks and it doesn't apply to social tasks. And that te generally tends to be how the economic literature thinks about things. Intellectual, social, physical. This is only really talking about intellectual tasks. But nevertheless, this is like a profound reshaping of how much we can accomplish. And so on the one hand, and it's just going to be unbelievably powerful, like think about all the developments in, um, in things like medicine, uh, education, um, that this kind of uh, graph would enable. You know, every single kid can have a personal tutor you know, of total expert level available to them at almost zero marginal cost. Everyone can have a GP in their pocket to query at any moment about any symptom and diagnose them probably better than any current doctor would be able to. So there's phenomenal upsides to that, but of course, as with any new technology, there will come a bunch of disruptions and it will you know, change what's valuable in society and that will have a load of downsides as well. And so I guess that's why I feel like it's so important to actually think seriously about if this holds true, what it would mean, because there will be things we can do to prepare for that. There will be ways that we can manage that and try and get as much of the upsides and as little of the downsides. We'll never be able to completely zero out one or other, um, but we will be able to manage it, and, but we'll only be able to do that if we like, actually have a real plan. Because I suppose you've, you compared this to, to COVID. COVID's by far the biggest disruption of my life, and for, same for a lot of people. This might seem strange, but could this be as big as COVID in terms of disruption, bigger than COVID? If the trend continues and if it generalises, so two very big ifs, but if those were true, this would be way bigger than COVID. Like, you know, it's, it's in a sense, COVID was a temporary shift until, you know, we had figured out vaccines and immune systems adapted and the virus changed. This will sort of be a more permanent reshaping of, of how everything operates. And last question on here, just putting, again, putting in things in perspective. In a technological sense, what is this shift like? Because we've come so far, so fast from not really being able to kind of form a proper sentence to talking with voice, l just like a human. Yeah. Um, yeah, can you, can you think of an analogy to kind of put that, to put that in, in perspective? Yeah, it's hard, but it, I mean, it, it sort of feels to me something like um, you've gone from basically the first, the, the first like flight to something like Concord in a, in a seven year period. And that is a very big deal. Uh, at least again, inside software development mm -hmm. with the caveats around that. I've Especially seen. when you think that there might be a lot more after Concord. And there could be a lot more okay. still to come. Wow, thank you. You'll notice that Mark wasn't talking about AGI or super intelligence or AI consciousness or any of these other kind of big unknowable questions that you hear people talk about. He was just talking about the simple fact that AIs are getting better at doing things that we do with our brains. I thought the number that he said really st stood out. There's a doubling every seven months. And he reckoned that we've got another, maybe another five years of this. When you saw that graph, where will it go next? And there are so many questions this poses. What does this mean for jobs? What does this mean for media? What does this mean for the way we all interact and understand truth? I mean, I don't know the answer, and I don't think Mark does either. But I think he's saying that it's something we should be thinking about. And I guess, sounds about right.